Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the Art Department's Visiting Artist and Critics Lecture Series with our guest tonight, Dr. Alexandra Peck. I'm Christine Baumler, the current chair of the Art Department at the University of Minnesota. I want to begin tonight by acknowledging that the University of Minnesota is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. The Dakota people, along with the Anishinaabe people, are the indigenous peoples of the land currently called Minnesota. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and will work to hold the university accountable to indigenous people and nations. Before I introduce our guest tonight, I want to thank Assistant Professor Rotem Tamir for her leadership on the Visiting Artists Committee over the past year. And I'd like to thank our Zoom hosts, Karen Hazelman and Nolan Lindsay. My dog has now joined us, so I hope she'll be, be quiet. Um, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Alexandra Peck. Welcome, Alexandra. Alexandra Peck is an anthropologist interested in past and present experiences of indigenous adaptation and cultural change in relationship to landscape and material culture. Her work examines ethnic and cultural intersections in the Pacific Northwest, where multiple tribes, settler descendants, tourists, and immigrant populations inhabit Washington's Olympic Peninsula with varying degrees of contestation and coexistence. Awarded her PhD from Brown University, Alex is the visiting scholar of indigenous studies supported by the Mellon Environmental Stewardship, Place, and Community <laughs> Initiative at the Institute for Advanced Study. We were fortunate to have Alexandra participate in a cross-institutional workshop on decolonizing place-based arts research with MFA and PhD students from the University of Minnesota, as well as students from Duncan of Jordan Stone College of Art in Scotland in the spring of 2021. And we have exciting news tonight. Alex will be joining the Department of Art History, Visual Art, and Theory at the University of British Columbia through an endowed chair in Historical Indigenous Art, a position that will focus on the works from the 18th to the early 20th centuries and lead research on Northwest Coast Indigenous art in the context of Indigenous and global art history. So we're very happy for Alex. We're, we're sad for us, but we have been so fortunate to have worked with Alexandra this year. We will miss you, Alexandra, but wish you the best in your next endeavor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alexandra Peck. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that lovely introduction. Uh, without further ado, I think we can begin. I will start sharing my mini slides with you. Uh, all right, you can all see those okay. So thank you again for, for taking time out of your evening uh, to, to listen to me talk about women's art um, in kind of a Pacific Northwest indigenous um, arena. This presentation really focuses on different aspects of indigenous women's artistic practices, such as basketry, tiles, um, and dyeing, dyeing fabric or textiles in conjunction with land and water use practices. Uh, my primary argument is that native women's access to and mastery of the waterways allowed them to create material culture that subsequently enhanced their social, political, and economic standing prior to, as well as during the early colonial era, um, which for these purposes is defined as kind of the early to mid uh, 1800s. In another way, my research resists stereotypes of femininity as domestic, land-based, or immobile and instead presents women as mobile, independent scientists engaged in the public arena, as well as in supposed wilderness settings. I'm combining my interests in art, gender, and the environment to discuss settler colonialism and indigeneity. I'm not examining art or artifact um, specifically, which you'll see kind of as the talk goes on, but instead I'm looking at how art uh, art making, the production of art, was informed by and facilitated relationships with the natural world. In turn, art production and environmental connections fostered female autonomy 
that many non-Native individuals were uncomfortable with. Lastly, you'll notice that the items I am describing as art are in this setting usually utilitarian or craft work. Uh, I'm choosing not to really make this distinction because historically male scholars and specialists have derided uh, women's material culture practices as lesser than men's art, which generally consisted of sculpture or art that was created for display rather than household um, or everyday use. So this, this trope remains common today, unfortunately, um, but this talk kind of tries to resist some of these narratives. So here you'll see a couple maps uh, that show you the region that I'm going to be discussing. Um, on the, the right, you see the Northwest Coast is split up into many, many different tribal groups. And you'll see in the uh, lower portion of that map, there's kind of an ugly 70s green um portion that says coast salish and so that's the the specific area that we're going to be talking about the coast salish tribes um, there are dozens of them unique individual communities their ancestral territory encompasses western washington as well as southwestern british columbia they share broad linguistic and cultural similarities as a result of their long history of intermarriage and alliances with each other However, individual Coast Salish tribal nations maintain distinct languages and cultural practices, all of which are loosely related and similar. As an all encompassing term, the word Coast Salish is used to refer to dozens of these various indigenous communities. Using Coast Salish society as a case study, this presentation highlights how indigenous women utilized water and maritime resources before and during European arrival. Water, when used by Coast Salish women to travel, trade, and cultivate specific natural materials, allowed women to maintain distinct Coast Salish artistic traditions, such as wool weaving and basketry, even when faced with societal crisis caused by 19th century settler colonialism. Accessing waterways also maintained women's geographic and familial ties that were important for survival. These connections were fostered by women through canoe travel, as well as when working in modern maritime roles for mining companies and fish canneries that I'll discuss later. Continuing to use water-based transportation and maritime routes fostered a high level of socioeconomic autonomy amongst Coast Salish women, which mirrored the freedoms and authority claimed by them in the pre-colonial past. Lastly, Coast Salish women's relationships with water helped women resist constricting definitions of femininity that did not align with Coast Salish understandings of womanhood. This proved especially beneficial during a period that demanded Coast Salish women assimilate and adopt non-native norms, many of which were rooted in misogyny and settler colonial attitudes uh, of civilizing Indian women, as well as the local environment and landscape. For Coast Salish women, the natural landscape and waterways did not represent an unknown or mysterious environment that necessitated male exploration or control. Rather, women were familiar with islands, riverbeds, tide flats, and ponds. All of these waterways not only provided for women's families in different ways, but these watery places also offered Coast Salish women opportunities to reinforce their authority and status in creative ways. Rather than hoarding wealth or restricting community membership to a small group of individuals, pre-colonial Coast Salish society aimed to grow as large as possible with as many hands in the pot, so to say, as possible. Although women clearly possessed reproductive abilities that led to larger communities, a woman's kin and trade networks were arguably of more importance. The more relatives one had dispersed over the uh, widest range of microenvironments, the greater the potential for the exchange of raw materials, finished goods, and services. Mobility was of utmost importance to Coast Salish women, who were encouraged and expected to marry outside of their immediate tribal nation. After marriage, women would generally relocate to their husband's village while traveling back to their mother village uh, throughout the year. These trips were taken in canoes with women navigating rivers and coastlines that functioned uh, essentially as ancient highway systems. A large extended kin network was highly coveted for increase, increased trade, 
uh, alliances during times of conflict, a diverse and healthy gene pool, and broader access to diverse resources and territories. By marrying those from other Coast Salish communities, Indigenous women increased their family's influence and gained wealth in the process. Women with strong family connections and trade networks were highly valued as marriage partners because they were viewed as well-traveled, industrious uh, entrepreneurs. Maintaining familial ties benefited women during times of hardship as well. If resources were growing lean as a result of drought or natural disasters, individuals would often relocate to other villages to kind of counterbalance uh, the scarcity. In pre-colonial Coast Salish society, a woman's ability to create and inherit wealth uh, via crops and handiwork, granted her seemingly unlimited status and authority. The flexible nature of Coast Salish, Coast Salish culture allowed for individuals to occupy different social ranks at different times in their lives, with community members often gaining or losing prestige uh, throughout their life, rather than being prescribed an immutable status at their birth. Women's property rights were well established as 19th century ethnographer George Gibbs reported when he observed that men own property distinct from their wives with women owning her own private effects such as blankets, mats, and baskets that belong to her. Another Coast Salish ethnographer noted that women could inherit tangible and intangible property from both their fathers and mothers. Similarly, when a woman's parents died or when a woman entered marriage, she received an inheritance from her family. Unlike a dowry, the payment remained a Coast Salish woman's distinct property throughout her marriage. Divorce was somewhat common uh, within Coast Salish culture, both before and after the early colonial peri period, and often occurred as a result of one partner being accused of laziness or decreased labor and production. These qualities represented important values in a Coast Salish setting and defined a person's worth. Coast Salish women of high rank would oversee the labor output and working conditions in their village and were known to employ specific female servants or slaves for their preferred ecological and culinary knowledge. As a result of their private property, financial independence and positions of authority, Coast Salish women were rarely left destitute in the event of divorce or spousal abandonment. Indeed, this follows broader patterns of high rates of marriage uh, dissolution amongst women who are high contributors to food production or whose separation does not interfere with the subsistence needs of either spouse or their children. Finances were not frequently commingled between husband and wife. This practice continued well into the 19th and 20th centuries. When working in hop and berry fields, Coast Salish women controlled the incomes of their adult children who worked alongside their mothers. As in the past, earnings were considered the mother's property and were then distributed amongst household members. Contemporary Coast Salish women uh, echo some of these attitudes, stating, my father always taught me that to be a good person, you should go out and work to make your own money separate from your husband's. I have always believed that. Another woman explains, what I make in the berry fields is my money. So is the money from knitting. I spend this money on the kids and other things we need. His money, her husband's money, pays the bills and the food. When he has no money, he has to ask me for some. Sometimes I say no, and so he has to ask his mother. As the following examples demonstrate, Coast Salish women covertly replicated traditional patterns of femininity and financial freedom while earning wages in settler society. Much of their success depended upon creatively retaining access to waterways and traditional crafts. Doing so increased female mobility, facilitated trade and economic opportunities, and encouraged the continuance of women's access to private property in the form of natural resources, which were then transformed into art and material wealth. Thus, female agency and maritime knowledge deserve credit as the major reasons for continued Coast Salish female autonomy. Prior to European exploration of Coast Salish territory in the late 1700s, 
an eventual settler colonial arrival in the mid 1800s, post-Salish women domesticated Salish woolly dogs. This medium-sized dog breed was highly valued for its white or light brown fur, which was sheared and spun to create clothing, regalia, and blankets. Breeding dogs for their use in fiber arts was rare in pre-colonial North America, making this Coast Salish example a particularly unique one. Coast Salish wool weavings dating from 1500 to the 1800s maintain similar, similar characteristics and quality, signaling an uninterrupted pattern of Salish woolly dog fur spinning and weaving. Coast Salish wool textiles predating the 1500s are not known to have survived the current material record, although it is safe to assume that the custom of segregating Salish woolly dogs and the art of weaving emerged long before this time period. By 1866, Salish woolly dogs were rendered extinct with the introduction of sheep's wool and European style attire, although their importance to Coast Salish culture is fondly remembered. And these are some weavings, um, early pre-colonial weavings made out of Salish woolly dog fur that was then dyed. Resembling a white downy Pomeranian, Salish woolly dogs were bred by Coast Salish women primarily for their fur. Although the small canines were also trained as seeing eye dogs, guard dogs, and are even credited with taking care of young children as babysitters when their parents were away. Ethnographer George Gibbs was presented with the Salish woolly dog in 1858, shortly before the dogs went extinct. He kept the dog as a pet and named the dog Mutton, alluding to its sheep-like qualities, being its furry white appearance uh, and its fur that resembled wool. To prevent Salish woolly dogs from breeding with other local dog breeds, as well as to protect them from coyotes and other dangers, Coast Salish women used canoes to transport the woolly white creatures to isolated islands. Islands were usually located near villages where women could regularly check in on the dogs or remain with them uh, while raising their pups. When islands were not available, Salish woolly dogs were enclosed in large pens or behind sturdy fences. Aided by natural waterways and landforms such as islands, Coast Salish women exercised personal autonomy while traveling and transporting their canines. In addition, women's scientific knowledge of selective breeding and husbandry was necessary for the care of Salish woolly dogs. Although it could be argued that Salish woolly dogs were tended to solely by women, because of the dog's role in weaving, which was traditionally a female activity, women's role in dog keeping was reflective of the economic, cultural, and political influence that female weavers held in Coast Salish society. Myron Eels, a Congregationalist missionary who lived on various Coast Salish reservations throughout the 1800s, noted that a Coast Salish woman's wealth depended upon how many Salish woolly dogs she owned. Weavers were considered women of high status, despite that Europeans viewed the art form as a lowly craft that was not considered high art. Unspun dog fur was then used as currency um, and also held monetary value. Although hand spun yarn was not prescribed a value until woven into a finished product. Other fibers such as fireweed, feathers or cattails were sometimes also integrated into strands of Salish woolly dog yarn, which made the wool softer, bulkier, and warmer. Although rare, mountain goat wool was often collected from high alpine mountains and then combined with woolly dog fur while spinning the yarn. Mountain goat wool was procured in the springtime when women and children entered mountain ranges to collect the material while men went hunting for elk in the same mountains. Women controlled the trade networks for mountain goat wool, which was traded with Coast Salish individuals uh, living on islands as well as farther south um, in Washington on the Olympic Peninsula um, in regions where mountain goats may not exist. In the early 20th century, a Coast Salish man described the exchange of bales of Salish woolly dog fur and mountain goat wool between local indigenous communities. He witnessed women taking a little wool away or adding some to a bale until both were happy that it was a fair exchange, implying that both materials were sought after and imbued with monetary value. 
His account also reveals that women were highly involved with trade and economic transactions, rather than solely with raising Salish woolly dogs and weaving their fur into blankets and robes. However, spinning yarn did occupy a large percentage of women's time. This task performed with a decorated stone or spindle whirl was also undertaken uh, during menstruation when discomfort and a need to be close to home were also greater. Once completed, the yarn, whose natural colors mimicked those of Salish woolly dogs um, in shades of white, cream, and light or dark brown, uh, the yarn was sometimes dyed with plants, roots, berries, or fungi to create brilliant blues, greens, reds, yellows, and even purples. Dyes were created by combi combining the plant materials with boiling water, concentrating the concoction, and later adding the yarn to steep for hours. And this is a photo of some natural dyes um, on, on wool yarn. Uh, as well as spindle whirls that would be then used to create yarn. Once the yarn was prepared for weaving, uh, blankets, robes, skirts, bags, and other textiles were then created on an upright loom. In, additioning, in addition to cordoning off dogs on remote islands, water played another important part in the production and preservation of Salish woolly dog textiles. Upon inspecting Salish woolly, Coast Salish wool weavings housed within museum collections, a researcher named Liz Hammond Karema identified a dried white powder that seemed to be pounded into the yarn itself. This resembled a clay-like substance, but further testing revealed that the powder was not clay at all, uh, but rather diatomaceous earth, which kind of resembles clay. Diatomaceous earth is created from the fossilization of microscopic algae that once inhabited saltwater bodies and lakes. As the algae dies off, its skeletons fall to the bottom of a lake or sea. And over hundreds of years, the layers uh, accumulate, forming a rock um, or almost paste that is easily crumbled when dry and that resembles clay when wet. This organic matter is known as diatomaceous earth uh, and was harvested by Coast Salish women, who then processed the material for use in wool weaving. Symbolizing ancient water sources and the organisms that once thrived in these waterways, diatomaceous earth provided women with another link to the maritime past. Diatomaceous earth was collected when it resembled a dark black mud and was formed into hand, into, hand, um, into balls with hands. The lumps were then baked, altering the color to a bright white and stored for later use. To use the diatomaceous earth for preserving natural fibers, such as Salish woolly dog fur or mountain goat wool, the baked balls were then mixed with water and applied to strands of the fiber before being spun into yarn. After the powder adhered to the fiber and re-hardened, the yarn was gently brushed or shaken to get rid of excess powder. Early anthropologist Franz Boas and 19th century Canadian geologist George Dawson both also identified this mysterious white clay as diatomaceous earth. Historically, native informants did not reveal to these ethnographers where the substance was collected from. A Coast Salish man who was interviewed in the 1930s stated that he knew of a local source for the clay, but that he would not divulge it. This demonstration of ethnographic refusal speaks to how indigenous individuals attempted to protect natural and cultural resources from the prying eyes of non-native individuals, as well as how women's traditional ecological knowledge was often safeguarded by men in the community. Today, diatomaceous earth can be found at a variety of lakes and mountains in Western Washington and Southern British Columbia, in addition to other sites that are not publicly shared uh, by tribal nations. Diatomaceous earth or clay is also found in regions that were inundated by tsunamis, where flooding created a distinctive diatom or algae layer seen in soil samples. Although such sites are no longer underwater today, the archaic layers of diatomaceous mud serve as a visible reminder of tsunami activity. This is one reason why diatomaceous earth is found within mountain ranges or in other high elevation areas along the Northwest coast. <clears throat> 
It is not a coincidence that Coast Salish women knew where to access this resource. Many Coast Salish tribes in Washington possess oral histories that recall nine recent tsunami events, uh, which occurred within a rapid period of about the past 20, 2,500 years. Remembering the massive floods that their foremothers survived to, to tell stories about, Coast Salish female descendants maintained tangible connections to these monumental water events, um, as well as to their cultural heroines by gathering diatomaceous earth that was then used for weaving. But what purpose did the substance serve? Uh, algae skeletons are hollow, which makes diatomaceous earth suitable for use in filters, such as in swimming pools today. Uh, diatomaceous earth is also safe for filtering drinking water and foodstuffs, such as honey or syrup. When applied to wool, uh, the, the substance allows liquids, such as water or sweat, to flow through the fiber in contrast to clay, which absorbs liquids, uh, such as grease. Although diatomaceous earth particles are non-toxic for human consumption and are often an ingredient in modern cosmetics as well as in your toothpaste, uh, the substance can kill small insects. The microscopic particles rupture the exoskeletons of insects such as fleas. So this was a natural insecticide uh, diatomaceous earth was applied to wool as a means of ridding the fiber of pests that may have originated with Salish woolly dogs or on mountain goats. It is for this reason that diatomaceous earth is today sold at your local garden stores, uh, where you can buy the product to control slugs and other bugs in home gardens. Ethnographers noted that this white powder appeared to, appeared to cure or clean the wool that was then woven into detailed Coast Salish blankets. Amy Cooper, a Coast Salish elder, recalls that diatomaceous earth served multiple purposes. In addition to cleaning the wool, the powder kept the fiber from slipping when it was spun into yarn. She describes diatomaceous earth as similar to talcum powder in this way. Uh, she also suggests that finished weavings were sometimes doused in diatomaceous earth meaning that the product would likely be used to quell any outbreaks of lice, uh, moths, or fleas that would sometimes appear in household settings, just as they do today. So turning or shifting focus a little bit, just as Salish woolly dog textiles simultaneously symbolized prestige and important everyday items, Coast Salish women tended to other items that were both necessary for survival and indicative of advanced environmental knowledge. Camas cultivation, the act of planting and harvesting a prolific blue flower with an edible bowl seen here. Uh, this activity fell under female purview and necessitated the use of waterways as well. A plant that is native to North America, camas bulbs resemble potatoes in their taste and consistency. The starchy caloric food source proved to be a pre-colonial staple in Coast Salish diets, with women preparing the root in a variety of ways. You could roast it in underground ovens, you could boil it and mash it, or you could dry it and later mill it um, into a flour-like consistency for baking. Women filled prairies full of camas plantings, where they tended to the bulbs year-round and ensured that a healthy crop was available in May when families spent weeks filling about 12 bags per person. Upon finding fields full of blue camas blossoms, early explorers to the Pacific Northwest remarked that the dense prairies resembled lakes from a distance. And this photo kind of shows you what that would look like. Women owned these camas patches or prairies, um, and these, these plots of land were passed down through the female line. Unless one was a member of a woman's uh, immediate family or obtained permission from a Coast Salish matriarch, harvesting camas in particular fields was off limits. In response, Native women often used um, wooden stakes as markers to communicate that their fields were neither you know, haphazard or up for grabs. And so these really were um, women's property. Darcy, who is a Coast Salish uh, interviewee, explains that harvesting camas takes a lot of skill. Her ancestors would cut a patch of the prairie and roll back the topsoil 
to take out the largest bulbs and then lay the soil back over the smallest bulbs, which were left behind to grow larger. White camas, uh, which is also known as death camas, needed to be avoided during harvest because it was toxic. During the blooming season, you mark every plant that is blue with a stake or a piece of brightly colored yarn, states Darcy, noting that you would not harvest any bulbs that had not been marked because unmarked bulbs lightly, likely bore white or toxic flowers. Maintaining camas prairies demanded even more expertise with controlled burns used to propagate camas and keep vegetal matter and small trees from overcrowding the camas fields. Knowing when and how to burn prairies required knowledge of seasonal rain and growth patterns, as well as determining how long and how hot to keep the fire. Poorly managed burns could quickly grow out of control, threatening local villages, animals, and forests. In contrast, burns that were too hot ran the risk of destroying camas instead of cultivating the plant. That Coast Salish territory was once ripe with camas fields before settler colonial homesteads arrived is evidence of Coast Salish horticultural proficiency. Reminiscing upon the past prairies that reliably bloomed blue each spring, Darcy states, you'd think you were looking at a lake, but it would always be a camas prairie. Without rivers, as well as the Pacific Ocean, Camas would not have maintained a stronghold in Coast Salish culture. Indigenous women traded with friends and relatives for new or rare varieties of Camas, signaling that the cultivation of this special flower was a selective and nuanced process. With canoes filled to the brim with Camas bulbs, women would paddle to distant tribal territories to barter for better bulbs. Sometimes women even planted new Camas fields as a means of signaling their rights to a specific plot of land. Eventually, Coast Salish women introduced Camas to Kwakwakiwak homelands, which are located further uh, north, British Columbia, located um, in northern Canada, central northern Canada. Coast Salish female interlocutors mentioned non-native male landowners who would prohibit women's access to Camas prairies and other fields traditionally owned by women. In response, women traveled significantly farther because of displacement and lack of prairie access. Fences and barriers were erected to keep women from accessing their camas crops, many of which were located on estuaries and rivers. This theft of property and privatization of land and water rights threatened Coast Salish livelihood, which depended heavily upon camas. Coast Salish women could no longer freely canoe up and down rivers to reach their camas plots, which were now deemed the property of non-native landowners. This led to an extreme camas shortage, and in some cases, severe hunger amongst 19th century Coast Salish families. By limiting women's movement, as well as their culinary and economic opportunity, European settlers ensured that the oppression of native women was tied to the conquering and taming of the local landscape. Livestock further decimated these root crops and discouraged women from returning to or trespassing on their own fields. Even native crab apple trees were chopped down to deter indigenous picking of the fruit, which were often given in large buckets during native wedding ceremonies uh, or gifted to prestigious individuals. By 1855, Coast Salish individuals in British Columbia began working in the mining and coal industry run by the Hudson's Bay Company. In addition to employing Coast Salish women to clean and salt salmon at trading posts, the Hudson's Bay Company relied upon women to transport coal dug by men in woven baskets and canoes. Women generally earned more than men for their labor and were also hired to gather shells for the production of lime used in construction and building projects. Coast Salish women also cleaned uh, and washed during this time, that being closed. Because no running or piped water systems existed yet, Native women were highly sought after for this job because they knew where freshwater springs were located. Water was then carted back to Hudson's Bay settlements where it was used for cooking and cleaning. Because of their connections to water and their ancestral knowledge of maritime environments, 
women secured specialized employment that allowed them to maintain relationships with important waterways, albeit not in the same way that they were doing before. Processing fish, weaving and canoeing, collecting shellfish, and identifying potable water sources were all duties that Coast Salish women uh, were familiar with. These jobs, which although took place in a settler colonial setting, granted Coast Salish women some semblance of autonomy and authority. It also preserved women's ecological knowledge and gave them the opportunity to revisit significant cultural sites that they may otherwise be banned from accessing. In the 1860s, the Hudson's Bay Company's uh, mining interests in Nanaimo, British Columbia, were transferred to the Vancouver Coal Mining and Land Company. As a result, Coast Salish women were excluded from mining work and became segregated from their male relatives. This pattern carried over to mills, which soon became dominated by men, although there exist accounts of Coast Salish women who participated in logging. Coast Salish women then began working in hotels and boarding houses as maids and cooks. Young women and girls would paddle canoes from their villages to white towns where they then worked. The mastery of canoes allowed women to work outside of the home and earn a wage. Some of these women were hired to care for white women during pregnancy or times of illness that necessitated treatment. Coast Salish women often provided medicines crafted from local botanicals, thus encouraging the continuance of female indigenous traditions and medical knowledge. Although they were free to travel between home and work, as well as to collect and prepare ointments and tinctures, uh, many Native women were increasingly restricted by the settler colonial gaze of domesticity. Unlike mining and milling, fish and shellfish canneries welcomed women labor, welcomed female labor, and indeed needed feminine skills, which included not only processing salmon, but sewing broken nets, digging for clams, and paddling boats or canoes. Young women traveled with their mothers in canoes that were bound for canneries, where they encountered female friends and families. Although husbands and wives went in separate directions for work, mining and logging for men versus canning and housework for women, uh, pregnant women and other mothers would travel long distances for work and wages, um, in a solo fashion or sometimes in the company of other women. This freedom mirrored Coast Salish women's trade and travel routes during the pre-colonial era, but because salmon and clam canning took place during the summertime, Native women were granted less time to harvest their own food and resources. While canneries fostered a physical link between Indigenous women and the maritime environment, the, these processing plants also functioned to sever women from traditional harvesting grounds. Some canneries were located on former village sites where Coast Salish women had formerly lived and worked for centuries, if not longer. And this is an example um, of one of those sites. These places undoubtedly represented a bittersweet homecoming for such women who now found themselves employed on their ancestral lands that they were otherwise barred from uh, living on. So now we're going to turn back to uh, weaving. Occurring concurrently with cannery labor, hop fields formed in the Pacific Northwest throughout the 1860s to 1880s. Many hop fields were located in Western Washington where Coast Salish women had lived and worked for thousands of years. Owned mainly by white farmers and businessmen who would then sell the hops to brewers for the burgeoning beer industry some hop fields were owned and operated by interracial couples. These partnerships usually included a white husband and a Coast Salish wife, with Coast Salish women supplying labor for the fields through their indigenous marriage and trade networks. So their, their family members basically worked for them in the fields. Because Coast Salish women maintained active ties to family members that extended throughout British Columbia and beyond, women would invite their distant relatives to work on their family's fields. For indigenous women who were forced to live on reservations that were formed by treaty negotiations and federal mandates, hot picking was a welcome reprieve because of the opportunity to travel far from the watchful eyes of Indian agents or missionaries. <laughs> 
Some hop farmers and investors chose former prairies for their hop fields. Prairies did not contain large cedar trees that needed to be cleared. Uh, they were often level in terms of um, the land and prairie soil was naturally high quality and well-drained. Many of these prairies were the same prairies that had been chosen and cultivated by Coast Salish women involved in camas growing only decades prior. When women relocated to work at hop fields, they were revisited, they revisited the prairies that they and their female ancestors had formerly owned and tilled. Perhaps symbolizing a bittersweet memory, working in hop fields brought Coast Salish women back to their homelands and allowed them to earn money while doing so. Not only did their female relatives once own the rights to these prairie grounds, but now 19th century Coast Salish descendants were invested in the hops that inhabited the same lands. Although agriculture, such as hop picking, might have been viewed as hard labor, suited for masculine hands in European settings, Coast Salish women were preferred as hop picking employees, even if they were elderly or had newborn children in tow. Employers noted that Coast Salish women were faster and more competent workers than men from the same communities. This can be attributed to women's familiarity with prairies and local growing conditions, as well as the sense of camaraderie and support that likely existed in a majority female workplace. And then lastly, we might also attribute this to the important role that wage earning had traditionally played in Coast Salish women's lives. Recognizing that picking hops and traditional Coast Salish women's duties seem to go hand in hand for a variety of reasons, Contemporary Coast Salish women discuss that their female ancestors possessed, quote, muscle memory. And this refers to the ability to kind of deftly use your hands to pick hops in a similar fashion to picking camas, picking berries, uh, or weaving blankets and basketry. Additionally, Coast Salish women employed traditional methods to gather hops, which led to the appearance of increased productivity and in turn, higher wages. What was the secret? Women used their own woven baskets while hop picking. The soft, pliable bottom of a basket, rather than the hard wooden box um, that hop farms often provided, uh, using a basket kept hops from being squished or compressed uh, when you pile on more hops to the load. Because wages were earned by the number of containers a woman filled per day, using a soft lightweight basket led to a quicker fill uh, because the fresh hops were kept from being flattened. So it created kind of the illusion of a, of a fuller basket. Non-native hop farmers uh, who were largely unversed in Coast Salish basketry likely did not realize that this sleight of hand was taking place. And so thus the fine handiwork that produced basketry um, also complemented women's work in the hop fields. And you can see photos here of, of baskets woven by Coast Salish women that they then used uh, while working. Between working in hop fields and at canneries, uh, while also weaving wool blankets, making medicine, raising children, and navigating rough waterways with canoes, Coast Salish women continued to search for new economic opportunities. While spending the summers picking hops, women traveled to nearby cities such as Seattle or Vancouver to sell fish and shellfish to non-native customers. These trips were relatively short, but not without careful planning. Temporary shelters were needed for these jaunts, especially because Pacific Northwest cities and towns often banned indigenous individuals from inhabiting urban areas. Ever resourceful, Coast Salish women harvested the stalks of tule reeds, which grew in freshwater ponds and lakes. You can see those here. The long reeds were then stripped and sewed together to create large flat mats. When draped over wooden frames or branches, tule mats could be then used as waterproof tents uh, or room dividers with mats also providing shade and insulation and doubling uh, as almost mattress pads if you were to lie down on them. And this is an example of one of those makeshift homes with tule reed uh, mats. Women would camp along local beaches and wetlands outside of city limits, uh, like Seattle, while traveling 
and camped beneath the shelter of tule mats that were well suited to the women's on the move lifestyles. Maritime campsites also granted women the opportunity to gather roots and grasses in watery places, including tidal flats, cranberry bogs, marshes, and eelgrass beds. These materials were important to the survival of Coast Salish basketry, an art form that women continued to rely upon. Although baskets were tools used in the hop fields, the woven containers were dual purpose. Intricate baskets accompanied their Coast Salish makers to urban markets where the women would sell the decorated vessels to tourists. You see images here of, of that activity. If not for access to waterways and knowledge of how to handle canoes, as well as participation in hop picking on former Camas prairies, Coast Salish basketry may have not emerged in cosmopolitan settings. Participation in wage labor did not entail an end to patterns of resource harvesting that had defined Coast Salish communities for countless generations, nor did ind indigenous workers simply participate in parallel but unconnected economies. Rather, women adapted to their sometimes dire circumstances and called upon ancestral customs to endure a rapidly changing world. Amounting to about a dollar per day, hop picking was not a lucrative business. Selling baskets, on the other hand, to unsuspecting non-Indigenous customers allowed Coast Salish women to determine the price of their wares. Additionally, Coast Salish women took advantage of urban passerby and their naive fascination with Indigenous material culture. Posing for photos with their basketry on sidewalks and street corners reaped significantly more money for these women than toiling away in hot fields. Although photography could be viewed as an exploitative act of the white male gaze, uh, which desired to capture these seemingly exotic women in unfamiliar city settings, uh, many Coast Salish women exercised agency by allowing their photos to be taken for a fee. Photos amounted to little labor on the part of the women, and when photographed with their baskets, uh, functioned really as a form of free advertising for the Coast Salish basket market in urban settings. Images of Native women crouched over piles of baskets on busy sidewalks may have conjured associations of a transient, impoverished, or unstable lifestyle to many non-Natives. However, the practice symbolized much more to Coast Salish women themselves. Women were accustomed to frequently traveling long distances via canoe to visit family and to tend to crops with bartering or selling handmade goods being just one skill of many that were possessed by Coast Salish matriarchs. Such women largely controlled the price and value accorded to items during pre-colonial and early colonial times. Why then would this 19th century setting be any different? Travel to cities from hot fields merely mirrored activities of the past and afforded Native women more autonomy than was customarily granted even to women of European descent. Employment opportunities for Coast Salish women in industry gradually decreased with the rise of missionaries and the influx of non-Native laborers. Women were discouraged from pursuing formal employment and uh, producing marketable art in favor of domesticity and motherhood. In 1911, the Canadian superintendent of Indian education lamented that only, quote, half of the indigenous women who graduated from boarding schools were married or made good housewives. Troubled that native women were leaving reservations to pursue education and employment, the superintendent claimed that federal policies needed to limit female travel and entrepreneurship to deter the temptations of an independent life. These beliefs were based on Victorian definitions of femininity uh, as domestic or docile, rather than Coast Salish notions of womanhood as public, mobile, and self-sufficient. In response, uh, Canada in particular passed the Indian Act in 1876. The legislation defined who legally qualified as Indian in Canada and has been derided for its unjust treatment of indigenous women in particular, 
who were subject to new restrictions that Native men did not face. So there's an extreme disparity happening here. Until the act was amended in 1985, Native women and their children were stripped of their status if they married a non-Native man or if they moved off of reservation lands. Reservation lands often consisted of poor quality soil, uh, were frequently flooded, uh, were inundated with pollutants, and often existed in isolated or kind of rural remote regions, not near uh, major urban centers. These regions were not conducive to healthy lifestyles because of pollutants uh, or acceptable water quality standards for harvesting and growing food or artistic materials such as tule reeds. In addition, attendance at and relocation to residential schools was required under the Indian Act, with indigenous ceremonies and gatherings such as potlatches uh, also banned. By confining women to reservations or demanding that they relocate to boarding schools, the Indian Act further limited Coast Salish female travel and economic opportunity while simultaneously demanding that women assimilate to non-Native ideals of femininity and domesticity. By threatening women with dissolution of their Indian status, the Act targeted women and made them extremely susceptible to cultural and familial disconnection. Native men were not subject to the same regulations and were instead free to marry and relocate without concerns about their or their children's status. The Discriminatory Act refused to recognize the amount of societal power that Coast Salish women had previously wielded, as well as Coast Salish lineage patterns of children gaining property and ancestral rights from either parent, rather than solely through patrilineal descent. The Indian Act represented female disenfranchisement, plain and simple. Without indigenous status, Coast Salish women lost treaty rights, could not participate in tribal community events, would not legally inherit property from their family, and were denied burial even at reservation cemeteries. Unlike previously, when Coast Salish women creatively utilized trade networks, wage labor, or traditionally woven items, such as baskets, to combat the new obstacles that they suffered, it proved more difficult to remedy the Indian Act. The treatment of Coast Salish women under the Indian Act mimics the settler colonial theft and transformation of Coast Salish landscapes and waterways throughout the 1800s and 1900s. Viewed as dispensable, threatening, and malleable objects whose very personas could be claimed or defined by non-Indigenous men, the similarities between Coast Salish women and Coast Salish waters are impossible to ignore. While the landscape was being civilized and redefined in non-Indigenous terms, Coast Salish women's children, lands, and legal identities were being stripped of them in a, in a similar way. Sensing that Coast Salish women were too, quote, independent and mobile, Federal legislation was enacted in the United States and Canada, such as the Indian Act, to limit women's access to, tr to traditional waterways and economic opportunities. Although not completely successful in its goals, the Indian Act legally redefined who qualified as a Coast Salish or Indian woman. No longer was Coast Salish femininity dependent upon maritime skills, trade, or shellfish gathering, nor was one's social status defined by intertribal familial ties, by one's weaving skills, or by property rights to Camas prairies. Instead, non-Native society categorized Coast Salish women by immobility, domesticity, and a monocultural rather than multicultural existence. Historically, Coast Salish female identity depended upon water. Waterways provided women with countless economic and artistic opportunities as well as fostered family ties, created nutritious and plentiful food sources, and encouraged female autonomy. To summarize, women traveled along maritime routes to visit relatives, to trade with tribal allies, to seek shelter during hardship, and to marry outside of their village to increase their community standing. Salish woolly dogs, whose fur was spun by women to create impressive textiles, and secure a woman's high socio-political status 
uh, were segregated on small islands that were accessible by women in canoes. Diatomaceous clay or earth formed from the skeletal remains of microalgae and used as an important insecticide for wool garments was located in wetlands and tsunami zones guarded carefully by women. Camas bulbs, a staple in Coast Salish diets, were propagated and rapidly spread throughout the Pacific Northwest as a result of female trade networks. In non-native settings, Coast Salish women worked in mining and canning operations where their specialized maritime knowledge proved extremely useful and afforded these women decent wages. As hop farming gained popularity, Native women took advantage of the seasonal travel by collecting basketry materials from wetlands and selling their woven vessels in me metropolitan centers, as well as posing for promotional photographs. Although indigenous access to land was threatened by settler colonial encroachment, Coast Salish women created resilient, adaptable ways to maintain their connections to waterways and natural resources, uh, largely through art and materiality. So on that note, I thank you all. And if we have time, I think we could open it up for questions, comments, or critiques. I will stop sharing. Oh, and can you stop sharing your uh, yeah. screen? Great. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, could we, I know we are maybe a little bit low on time, but um, do anyone, does anyone have any questions that you want to either share in the chat? And Karen, do you want to put the gallery view on if people want to raise hands? Mm -hmm. That was really amazing. Alex, thank, thank you. you so much. Alex, I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. I'm curious, you um, thank It was very interesting um, to learn about um, such, a, um, such a tradition uh, and interesting uh, crafts. And I, one of the things that I was wondering if um, um, how much it's practiced today. So how much, like what's going on today in terms of like, um, is there any generation who try to practice, you know, all these traditional crafts that you mentioned? And uh, I would curious to know what's going on uh, these days. Yeah, there, there has um, been kind of a revival of that, that wool weaving tradition. Obviously not with the dogs because the dogs are extinct. Um, so it's, it's more, you know, actual wool as, as we would know it. Um, but certain families who, who I know um, from the tribes that I work with actually do still go into the mountains and gather mountain goat wool because mountain goats are, are fairly plentiful and some would say too plentiful. There have actually been um, efforts to, to decre decrease the number of mountain goats because they, they cause some environmental destruction as well. Um, but many families are gathering mountain goat wool and are kind of reviving this natural dyeing um, of the fiber, as well as trying to revive um, some of the patterns and designs that you saw in the weavings. Um, a lot of that's really led by women. A couple men that I know of also participate in that. Um, and weaving is also a much more, in my opinion, approachable art form for people who maybe are two-spirit um, or who are non-binary, um, as opposed to carving, because this is the same region where you see many monumental carvings. Um, sometimes totem poles, sometimes just large sculpture. Um, and that's really dominated by men. Um, and that's somewhat problematic and controversial within the communities um, that men's art is often kind of held to a, a, a greater standard. People are more, um, you know, people respect it more, um, but it's also very exclusive and it, it really doesn't welcome women or people who may not fit into the, the gender binary. And so women's art, especially weaving, is kind of seen as a more inclusive um, environment. Alex, Jennifer Gunn is asking, why did the dogs go extinct? Can you um, Why or when? Why? Why? They went extinct. I mean, I don't know. We could give a lot of reasons for this. Um, 
I mean, sheep's wool was introduced and was kind of forced upon many, many tribes during this time period um, uh, by the Spanish who, who actually came and settled in the Pacific Northwest early on, um, as well as later by British and other European uh, communities. Um, the dogs were largely viewed by non-natives as kind of a nuisance and as just a reminder of indigeneity. And so like with many other things, um, they were almost forcibly made to go, go extinct. And then as women lost you know, access to land and access to waterways, they also lost places where they could kind of keep their dogs because often dogs were kept on islands. Um, and so the land loss really contributed to the extinction of, of kind of this, this native dog breed. Um, and instead, sometimes women, you, you would see them raising sheep, but often they were, they were just trading for wool that had already been processed. There are some comments of appreciation. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I just have a, a, a quick question. Um, I'm in the MFA program and have been doing research on um, quilting amongst mm -hmm. um, African-Americans and slavery and the, and the imagery work. And I'm curious if you studied at all, the imagery of the wool weavings and if it changed um, after European and colonial influences. Yeah, that was, thank you for the question. Cause that was something I didn't get time to talk about. Um, but so on some of those more historical pre-colonial um, weavings that I showed you that are more geometric, um, you know, squares and uh, kind of patterns like that, that sometimes you associate with like Navajo or Southwestern weaving. It looks, it looks very similar and there have been some comparisons made. Um, but what's interesting um, is that many Coast Salish women of the past and present claim that those designs actually depict like tribal law. Um, and so that certain patterns actually, if you know how to read them or interpret them, um, can tell you things about like tribal politics, tribal governance, uh, certain laws. And so it's really fascinating because women often refer to these, you know, robes or blankets, not just as regalia or clothing, but as documents that like it's a written language. Um, I can't read it, <laughs> but, but it's, it's fascinating. And that's something that I, I never would have known. I mean, if not for, for them. Um, so yeah, so that's what many of those patterns um, kind of, kind of can tell us is it's legal information. And then today, I guess to answer the maybe second part of your question, there has been a revival of that. Um, of using similar patterns, but today you see like a broad range of, of designs and motifs. Thank you, thank you all. Are there any final questions? I'm so glad we recorded that talk, Alex, because I feel like I could watch it again and just- Yeah, there's a lot of information. <laughs> so much information there, it's so rich and wonderful. Thank you so much. And I wonder if we could give Alex a Zoom round of applause, if you could maybe unmute yourselves and thank her for her wonderful talk and her contribution to our community over this past year. Alex, thank you so much. We've really enjoyed having you as part of our community. Thank you. Thank you for having me and including me. Yay. Thank you, Alex. Thank, yes. you, Alex. thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. you the best. Thank you. I'll see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>